This is level two of the CFA program, topic four, financial reporting and analysis, and the reading on integration of financial statement analysis techniques. This is a relatively short chapter written by a gentleman who is an accountant and who holds the CFA designation. And in this chapter, even though it seems like it could be a longer chapter, there are lots and lots of financial statements in there, which allows us to focus on these LOSs. And even though these LOSs look long, there's only five of them, and we'll cover those pretty completely in this relatively short slide deck as well. Let's go ahead and start with a brief recap. Uh, one of the great things about this chapter, and it is super well written, by the way, is that there's a great example in the beginning about an analyst who wants to evaluate uh, Nestle. And the beginning chapters, talk, I'm sorry, the beginning paragraphs talk about the importance of making economic decisions. And then there are these phases here, which I'll talk about here in, in just a moment. But economic decisions, of course, this is the ultimate goal for us as financial analysts. Uh, think of it this way, you know, either we own or our client owns some type of an asset. And we have questions surrounding that, economic decisions surrounding that. One reasonable uh, one reasonable question is, should we protect that asset? You know, if that asset is a piece of artwork, it's probably a relatively easy decision. We'll say, oh, sure, let's go ahead and get some insurance. But if it's a bond, we need to worry about things like duration and convexity. We need to worry about default risk, which then says, all right, if we're looking at all the stuff on the right-hand side of the balance sheet, we ought to look at all of the stuff on the right-hand side of the balance sheet, plus the left-hand side, plus the income statement, plus the cash flow statement. So look at that second diamond point, phases for a financial statement analysis framework, which is gonna help us make a decision of whether we should protect the bond using dynamic hedging or any kind of other hedging uh, uh, tool that we'll learn about later on in level two and of course, level three. And so this process here, relatively straightforward to find the purpose, collect input data, process data, interpret the data, and then tell everybody about it. And then of course, the last one is always important, but I think it's something that uh, analysts tend to forget over time. Make sure that the loop then goes all the way from the bottom back up to the top. Uh, this reading calls it a follow-up or feedback or, hey, let's figure out what we did right, let's figure out what we did wrong, and let's make sure that the next time we make an economic decision, we use our experience uh, so that we can be more efficient in our economic decisions. All right, so let's look at this first hugely long LOS. Demonstrate the use of a framework for analyzing financial statements. You know, you could have a period after that, right? But the Institute puts a lot of other stuff in there. And of course, we could imply all of those other things, problems, questions, purpose, et cetera, et cetera. So let's go ahead and start with this. Let's, uh, let's suppose that we have an example here, Prestige Incorporate long-term equity investments. So we're going to evaluate this. What is the objective of the analysis? So what's the purpose? Well, we want to see if prestige, well, what did I just say a few moments ago? What does their balance sheet look like? What does their income state look like? What does their, what is their uh, cash flow statement looks like? But then let's layer all of that with the supply chain, of course, on both sides. And then let's layer it with, all right, what does our client's policy statement look like? And then let's try to match that with the mission statement of Prestige Incorporated. Now that's not gonna be a perfect match at all, but of course, what we're trying to do is figure out the objective. And we want, what we wanna do is match our client's objective with what's out there. And so implicit in this first uh, component is that not only are we evaluating Prestige inc Incorporated long-term equity investment, but we're not doing this on an island. We're working, worrying about their competition and other companies that are out there because we, we might say no, and then we'll have to find some other outcome. But if we say yes, we want to make sure that it's superior to its competition. Uh, look at that third arrow point there. Create a purpose statement with the timelines and resources required. So this goes back to, boy, I learned this in an undergraduate, um, 
accounting information systems class where you have a flow, right? So let's do let's do a flow chart with a timeline. And maybe those timelines are precise, but maybe they're just kind of general, like, oh, in the next two months or something like that with timelines and then all those resources required. So that's probably a really good exam question. Uh, collect input data. I mean, this makes perfect sense, right? Let's start with the annual report, but then let's go to everything else that's out there from reading the Wall Street Journal to looking at the Bloomberg Terminal to evaluating the notes and the disclosures and everything else that's out there um, about Prestige Inc. All right, after we collect the data, then we have to process the data. And then sometimes there's going to be required or necessary adjustments. And the main adjustment in this reading is an evaluation and an adjustment with return on equity. Of course, we know return on equity is just net income, which is the bottom of the income statement over total equity, which is the bottom right of the balance sheet. And what we can do is we can divide that into its components. But of course, what we want is, I mean, we want lots of numerator, right? We want lots of net income. And then what do we want with total equity? Well, I mean, there's an optimal capital structure. Of course, we learned this going back to 1958 and Medigliani and Miller, but that total equity in the denominator is gonna give us a sense of how much debt, how much leverage that the company uses. And so that's what we're gonna do with uh, return on equity. And notice that orange, um, arrow point down there. Anal analyze the composition of the asset base and capital structure. All right, so that's super important. And you might remember that we did some segment analysis in a previous recording, and that's going to help us to decide on where those bond issues and stock issues and any other kind of issue that shows up on the right hand side of the balance sheet where does that capital get allocated? Of course, we know it goes over to the left-hand side of the balance sheet, and we want to know exactly where it goes, which segment. Let's go ahead and remind ourselves about earnings quality. We had a whole reading on earnings quality. I think there were 40-some slides in there. Um, here, in this reading, we're just going to highlight a few of those things. So I'll go over this quickly because this should be a reminder. Accruals ratio. Um, if we have this ratio, uh, cash flow from operations over operating income. All right, so think about that cash flow, which ought to be cash flow over operating income. Remember that, uh, remember that the accounting rules allow things like net income and income from operations to be more easily manipulated or massaged than than cash flow. So if this ratio is greater than one, that implies fewer chances of manipulation. Uh, we'll go ahead and look at some ratios. Uh, cash flow from operations over total assets, cash flow from operations over capital expenditures. And what that will do is that will answer the question that sounds something like, all right, let's suppose we have 100 in cash flow from operations during this quarter. What does that mean? Well, if we have if we have a million or a billion in total assets, a hundred over a billion, boy, that's pretty low, right? And then if we have cash flow from operations of a hundred and capital of expenditures of hundreds of thousands, well, that's low as well. And that implies some things like, okay, those assets are not performing very well, first of all. And then second of all, boy, if we have all these planned capital expenditures, we must be going to the debt market or the equity market. But primarily, we're worried about the debt market because then we have to focus on things like, you know, default risk and interest rate risk. So let's look at that purple arrow point, decompose and analyze the company's valuation. So we're going to find the standalone value of the company by eliminating the value of associates and joint ventures. Now, this goes back to that Nestle example in the beginning of this reading. And in fact, it's reported that Nestle enjoys lots and lots of joint ventures and investments in associates. And so the question becomes, all right, if, if Nestle has 100, let's say, but but 90 of that comes from joint ventures or investments in other companies, well, then that leaves only 10. So then Nestle by itself is only 10. The other 90 comes from uh, 
from somewhere else. So we need to look at PE ratios, we need to adjust the balance sheet, and we need to make sure that we're aware of all the accounting standards and changes in those standards and see how they impact not only the accounts inside of the financial statements, but, but perhaps even more importantly, the ratios. All right, analyzing and interpreting the process data and then develop commun and communicate conclusions. So here's where we're going to go back to, boy, when do we start learning about writing? Third grade, eighth grade, twelfth grade, whatever grade it is. So we need to make certain that we have good writing skills and we have good communication skills, which means that we're going to put together a professional report. And then the follow-up, look for new data and update the analysis. This is kind of the feedback loop, right? Follow-up, let's make sure that we make this financial decision. So let's suppose we go ahead and say, yes, we, we want to invest in Nestle because, what did I say, the 90 and the 10? Let's suppose it's opposite, you know, and most of, most of Nestle's um, profitability comes from its own product lines and its own operations. And then we might want to say something like, okay, we're making this decision. We love this company's stock or we love these, this company's bonds. We're going to make the investment, but then we're going to keep updated, right? Maybe next week something happens. Maybe somebody comes out, some surgeon general from a country says, oh, he just did an analysis and eating two pounds of chocolate a month will make your ears grow really, really large or have your fingernails turn a different color or, or, or. So we need to make sure that there are, well, I've said this to you before, I have a colleague who loves this term end scan. We're going to scan the environment, but we're going to maintain our scan of the environment throughout this whole process. There's a large section in the reading on the DuPont analysis. So let's go ahead and uh, remind ourselves that DuPont, this is, boy, this goes back to 1920, 1940, I don't know, sometime a really long time ago when the DuPont company said, you know what, we can break down this return on equity into measures of operating efficiency measures of asset use efficiency and measures of the use of financial leverage. So notice that what, I, what we've written down there in words. So ROE is equal to uh, net profit margin times asset turnover times leverage. And so there are the three components of the original DuPont analysis. And of course, those of you who are mathematically inclined, which I'm hoping is all of you, will be able to identify the sales in the denominator and numerator and the total assets in the denominator and numerator and note that they cancel. So ROE, of course, is just net income over total equity, but it's decomposed into answering the following questions. Right. What are we doing here? You know, a purpose, identify the problem, objective, client objective, all that kind of stuff. What are we trying to do? We're trying to determine whether or not a company is profitable. And we can look at return on equity, and it might be 20% or 30%. And on the surface, we might say, hey, that sounds super. That, uh, let's move on with our lives. But once we decompose it, we can say, all right, the bulk of this, what did I say, 20 or 30%, the bulk of this comes from operating efficiency, or the bulk comes from asset use efficiency, or the bulk comes from leverage, or maybe they're evenly distributed. And so we can see our strengths and our weaknesses inside of this decomposition. Now, I tell my students all the time, I never require them to do this in my class, but in all of their other business classes, it seems they do a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, uh, opportunities and threats. And they do this all the time. And I say to them, hey, whenever you're answering an exam question, something like this, or whenever you're writing a paper, it's always good to do a SWOT analysis. And even though this is not a SWOT analysis and nobody would ever claim that it is, but it allows us to identify those strengths and weaknesses of uh, a company's operations. And then of course, uh, the next step is to answer the following question. Is it possible that a company is propping up return on equity by using substantially depreciating assets? Or is it trying to hide some poor performance? And this is all inside the tax environment. So this is the extended DuPont analysis, where now we have five components 
And those five components are super similar to what we just did in the regular DuPont analysis, but we add the interest burden and we add the margin on operating income. The reading calls this EBIT margin. So look down at the bottom gray box. And of course, the denominators and the numerators, they still cancel going all the way over. So we still have net income over equity, but now, now we're adding in the simple fact that hey, if a company issues bonds, it gets a subsidy by allowing those interest payments to be an expense on the income statement. And so is the firm tempted to be over leveraged and supporting that ROE just through the use of leverage rather than through the use of operations? So let's take a look at just a super quick example here. So we have sales, EBIT, uh, EAT, earning, uh, I'm sorry, EBT, then net income, then total assets, then shareholders equity. And so there's this five-way decomposition of ROE. And you can do all the math right there and it comes out to be 40%. So it's probably super helpful to come back here and say, all right, there's a tax, there's interest. Uh, there's leverage, right? There's an uh, operating income margin, there's total asset turnover. And so what can we see? You can see that that 40%, and you can come up with each one of those ratios, each of those five ratios. And then of course you wanna do this over time with a trend analysis to see which one of those is increasing, which one of those is decreasing, where do we get the majority of our performance from? And so the interpretation of the, here, let me go back here just quickly. The interpretation of that extended DuPont analysis is identical to the interpretation of the original DuPont, but it has a couple of extra layers in there. Now, how about biases and financial reporting choices? Now, remember, I've said this before, the Institute is not requiring us to have a CPA, but it is requiring us to, when presented with some accounting information, we don't want to look at it and say, what in the heck is this? I have no idea what a deferred tax liability is. So they want us to know about it. We don't need to know uh, the journal entries behind uh, behind everything. Although you could probably you could probably make one up that's pretty close to uh, what the accountants want you to do. All right, so let's look at some of these circle points. Um, yeah, what do we do when we compare financial statements that are, have been prepared using different accounting treatments, right? If we're comparing uh, Nestle with Hershey Foods, right? And suppose Nestle uses Jim's accounting method and Hershey uses John's accounting method and these two methods are completely different and yet they have the same ratios, then you would be mistaken if you said, oh, these companies are identical. So we'll have to make those adjustments to keep the analysis logically consistent. That makes perfect sense, right? Now, in addition to, here, let me just go back here real quickly. Uh, in addition to what DuPont and what the extended DuPont analysis allows us to do, decompose the profitability, it allows us to extract that investment in associates and uh, joint ventures. So look at that third uh, embedded circle point, removes the effect of investments and associates from the balance sheet and the income statement. So that's what we're going to do here over the next couple of slides. And this is what, oh, I don't know, maybe five or six pages worth of financial statement after financial statement in, in that reading. All right, so here's the example. Prestige Inc. conducts a DuPont analysis. Uh, the analyst notes that Prestige has a substantial amount of income from investments in associates and joint ventures. So this goes back to what I was saying with Nestle. What did I say? The 90 and the 10. If it's 90 and 10 in favor of the associates, well, then the underlying company is probably going to be struggling uh, by itself. But if it's the other way around, then we want to make sure that, that we know that. All right, I want you to close your eyes. You don't have to close your eyes, but I want you to pretend that you're closing your eyes. You're sitting uh, in the level two exam and you flip the page and, you, and there's a vignette. And so the top of the vignette reads this. The analyst does this, does this, and then boom, here you have 
some financial statement data. And notice what we've given you here. These are really short ones. So look for probably a little bit longer ones uh, in the vignette. Um, not so much to confuse, but just to alert you uh, with all of the eye candy there. All right, so there's revenues and operating income, uh, profit before taxes, associates and joint ventures. That's good, EBT. There's net income and there's the profit exclusive to the associates and joint ventures. All right, so we got the top stuff in orange, income statement, and then we have some balance sheet data. All right, so notice what's happening here. So we have a net income of around 14, right? But about half of that comes from the associates and joint ventures operations. But look at the balance sheet. We've got total of 121, and we've invested only seven in those associates and joint ventures. All right, so there's a war ding, 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 you know, hello, McFly. All right, so let's, let me read those diamond points down there. So part of the income relates to ownership. All right, we know that. Subtracting income from the associates and joint ventures from the net income gives profits generated by Prestige's own asset base. All right, so we want to know exactly what is the profitability of just Prestige and not all of these other organizations and businesses that are out there. Although that's, of course, important. I'm not trying to discount the importance of them, but we want to isolate. All right, there's our calculation for return on equity. I did that just quickly. So there's the 13,939 over the 62.50, right, net income. So that's 0.23, right? 23% return on equity. And then I did the quick, uh, we did the quick three DuPont uh, analyses there. You can go ahead and, and pause the video if you wanna, if you wanna do the math, but you can probably see that denominators and numerators cancel each other, so you probably don't have to. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the expanded DuPont analysis. Now remember, here, here's our goal. Our goal and our mission and our objective, those are all three the same here in this case. What are we trying to do? Figure out, figure out if Prestige operates all by itself or if it relies heavily on those uh, outside investments and joint ventures. So there's a bunch of stuff here in this extended DuPont analysis table. Uh, so those percentages, those are taken from the table on the previous slide. Those are not too terribly important. But let's go ahead and start with the fourth line, net profit margin, excluding the income from associates. So let's start with the 6868 over the 78966. That gives us... 8.69%. Uh, but then when we include the income from associates, we get all the way back up to that 13,939 from the previous uh, slide, and that gets us to a net profit margin of 17.65%. So the associates effect on net profit margin, that's about double, right? The 200, if you do the math, 203. So look at that, you got 18, you got eight and then 17. So that's, that's almost twice the amount. So our net profit margin is doubled, let's say, because of our investments. So let's go ahead and look at the asset turnover with and without the associates. So there's 692 with and 649 without. And that gives us an extra 044 in that total asset turnover because of our investment in the associates. So then we can quickly do a return on assets. That's the 13,939 over the 121. So that gives us 11.44% and the return on equity. So there's the 1764 and 202. So that's what, that's what I just did on the previous page. Let me just go back and make sure you get this. So there's my, there's the 23% at the bottom of that page. And then here, here I have the ratios and here I have the answers to the ratios there. So 23% and we're going to try to decompose this. All right. So you ready? Now we did all those math 
operations on the top part of the table so that we could do this middle one here. So prestige's only return on equity. We're going to take that 8.69 percent. We're going to multiply it by the 692 and then we're going to multiply it by the leverage of 202 and that gets us 1216. Oh my gosh. So the associates contribute. Here, can I round? The associates contribute about 11 percent. Prestige contributes about 12 percent and that gets us up to our 23 percent. So you see how this is really a cool analysis in, you know, if we go back here and I end the story down at the bottom and say, OK, return on equity is 23 percent. End of story. Well, that's clearly not the end of the story. That's clearly not a completed story. Now we go through these adjustments. Now we've completed the story. So now we need to say, all right, do we want to invest in this company or not? Knowing, knowing that it has the investment in these associates, which it may or may not have a lot of influence over. And the same with the joint venture. A, are those things efficient? I mean, they look like they are here in this example, but are they going to continue to be efficient? Right. They're kind of out of our control. We have some control, but th there's a large component of the control that uh, that we we can't see or we can't even influence. So the question then becomes, are we satisfied with that 12 percent? The answer might be yes. And the answer might be yes, because we have executives who are able to identify businesses over there that are worthy of our investment and worthy of joint ventures. That might be a perfect skill set. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we can sustain. Oh, we've heard that term sustainable growth for lots and lots of our lifetime in the CFA program. All right, how about moving on to another LOS? Points to consider when identifying financial reporting choices and biases. Okay. All right, so we just did this disaggregation. What did I call it? An isolation technique, right? Such as the DuPont analysis, which eliminates the equity income from associates and the investment account. What that does, it allows us to assess the balance sheet composition over time. You hear me say this regularly. Trend analysis is super important. So much so that didn't we spend a whole reading on time series regressions? Yeah, so here's one of those times when you can apply that. And then, boy, I love that fourth arrow point. Find if the capital structure is adequate to sustain. There's that word again, sustain and sustainability. And I love going back to 1958 and Medigliani and Miller capital structure, right? That's the source of capital. Are we and have we arrived and can we maintain an optimal capital structure? Not just optimal in the sense of maximizing value and maximizing shareholder wealth, but optimal in the sense that we're able to match the goals in the strategic plan with our capital structure and to meet those future obligations. All right, how about another LOS on earnings quality? We did this in a previous recording. Sustainability and persistence, right? One of the ways we can do this is look at a couple of ratios. So let's look at the uh, balance sheet based accruals ratio, yearly changes in net operating assets over average net operating assets or the cash flow based accrual ratio where we have net income minus cash flow from operations minus cash flow from investing over those average net operating assets. So this is what happens if you look at the trend and the trend looks like this. Well, then there's probably not much manipulation going on, but if the trend looks like this. Well, then you have to scratch your head and say, all right, why? Oh, why? If the company is making, you know, chocolate bars, why are these ratios going up and down? All right. How about some good questions about cash flow relationships? We have two slides on this. All right. Does the cash flow back uh, the operating income? In other words, in other words, you know, we've got these product lines over here. Let's go with Nestle and, and do the chocolate. So we're selling lots and lots of chocolate. So we get cash flows from the chocolate. Where do those things go? I mean, we know from an accounting standpoint that they have to flow back over to 
retain earnings and out of retain earnings and it can pay a dividend. But then once they're hidden in that retain earnings, where do they go? Do they go to investment in new positive net present value projects or do they go to executive stock options? Is the operating income the result of accounting choices? Boy, this is a good one. Remember, operating income, you got the revenues up here and then expenses here. And we have lots of ways, even inside of the accrual-based accounting, to decide when we want to recognize revenues and when and by how much we want to recognize expenses. And so that operating income ought to be a measure of the quality of the product lines, right? Make something for pennies and sell it for dollars. But those accounting choices make it uh, makes the possibility that we make something for pennies and sell it for tens of dollars. But of course, that accounting choice is going to reverse itself at some point. So we're going to make something for pennies and sell it for micro pennies. So we need to make certain once again that we look at this over time. Oh, yeah. Compare cash flow and its relationship to net income. You know, in a perfect world, those two numbers would be. I don't want to use the word identical, but I'm going to. In a perfect world, they should be identical or nearly identical. But of course, they're not. But they should have a stable relationship, right? If one's way up here and one's way down here and they're reversing all the time, well, then there's probably some massaging or manipulating going on. Uh, determine ratio of operating cash flow before interest in taxes um, and adjust those for different accounting changes. Uh, amortization of goodwill. That's always a good one where we can pick up the phone and say to our fellow accountant, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Accountant, can you help me out here with, uh, with this accounting change as it relates to amortization? Yeah, look at that last diamond point. Make the appropriate adjustments to keep the comparisons between cash flow and earnings symmetrical. So let's go back up to that. What is that? That second or third diamond point cash flow and relationship to net income, you know, ought to be pretty stable. Down here, the reading uses the word symmetrical. And so we can do a couple of things like add cash paid for interest and taxes, and we can add goodwill, and then we can do some things like suspend the amortization of goodwill. But once again, at least me, I'm picking up the phone and I'm calling my, uh, my accounting friend and say, help me to understand this. Yeah, let's go ahead and continue this slide between total assets and operating cash flow. So what do we know? These total assets. Now, it's total assets, but what I want to focus on are the assets that have positive net present values. What should they be doing? They should be generating lots and lots of cash flow, right? So lots and lots of operating cash flow. Forget about free cash flow for now. Lots and lots of operating cash flow. Make sure that you understand that cash flow then relates all the way back to total assets. Yeah, total assets show the overall management's resource allocations. This was uh, a comment on that earlier slide about, you know, we have capital structure over there. We issue bonds, we issue shares of stock. And where does that get allocated to? Positive NPV projects. But here, you ready? Which segments are being allocated the most capital? In, fi in fact, I mean, essentially, you have, let's say you have five segments over here, and this first segment has positive NPV of 100. The second has positive NPV of, let's say, 10, and then 8, and 9, and 7, right? Is that five of them? So what should you do? You should issue a bond and then throw it all up to that top segment, right? So this is a measure of how management is allocating those resources we would like to think that that's going to find the capital will find its most uh, profitable outlet. Of course, we need to compare cash flow to things like payments on the bond and reinvestment back into our positive net present value projects. Of course, all you have to do is watch television. Um, you know, I hardly ever watch TV with the exception of sporting events and Seinfeld, of course. And so, you know, every once in a while you have to watch a commercial, but you see these product lines that have been around for thousands of years and they're getting better and they're improving and they're getting better and they do more and more things. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld has a really funny bit on, uh, on Tide about how Tide has improved over the years. All right, so compare cash flow to, right, those product lines, they're begging for cash flows to improve. 
but we also have to pay off the, the bondholders. And then, of course, we have to pay off the shareholders as well. All right, so the results show whether the company has adequate resources, right? We just said that, and additional borrowing. So this is important in that, boy, we would love to have enough cash flow to finance all of our positive net present value projects and the reinvestment in those, but sometimes we have to go to external markets. All right, how about the impact from accounting changes? All right, there we have a FASB number 140. Um, I'm pretty sure I haven't memorized FASB 140, but what it does, it allows a company to remove financial assets from its balance sheets by transferring them into, oh my gosh, I'm going to squeeze my head here, a qualified special purpose entity. All right, so these things here, we've talked about them multiple times, these things are not inherently bad or dangerous, but what happens is that you can put these things, these assets into, um, uh, special purpose vehicle or whatever you want to call it and you can kind of hide the leverage um, yeah look at the second arrow point there asset exclusion and liability non-recognition oh boy just think Enron all right how about if we um, look at a specific example here and some ratios so here we have prestige right we, we've talked about this company before in our examples we sell 20,000 of finance receivables to a special purpose entity. So we create this entity over here. Here, can you see my hands? My hands are here and now they're wet. So this entity, it's, it's outside of your viewing range. At least I hope my arms are long enough that you're outside the viewing range. So as a financial analyst, what are you required to do? You're required to either get out your phone and turn it on a panoramic view so you can see that SP out there. Or if you're, I mean, I'm not nearly as cool to do that kind of stuff. I would just back up. I just back up until I can see this and, and then I can see that. So that, that's, that's, my, that's always my answer to these uh, special purpose vehicles is that, hey, just tell me what's in them. Tell me they exist, you know, and you can find these in the notes or the management discussion, and then, then just tell me what's in them and then I can make those adjustments. All right, so here, uh, here we have some uh, balance sheet items. And then let's go ahead and determine the financial leverage if the company does an A and a B here, just treats them as sold, right? That's just the 121 over the 60. So there's our, there's our uh, leverage multiplier, right? That we had 2.022 from before. But now let's suppose we hold these security, securitized financial receivables on the balance sheet. Well, if you do the math, you get uh, you get 2.35. So there's a huge difference between 2.35 and 2.02, and that would have an impact on what was our original goal. Our original goal was to make a financial decision or an economic decision, and that sounds an awful lot like, okay, do we want to invest in this company? Yes or no? The difference between 2.02 and 2.35 that ought to that ought to give you a pause and say, boy, I'm glad I know the difference between those two before I make that decision. All right, how about additional off balance sheet leverages? All right, so an operating lease, this is a liability that's kept off the balance sheet. It's almost like renting, that's, what I, that's the way I learned it from a really good accounting professor back in the old days. Uh, it's an operating expense over on the income statement. But how about how about a capital lease? Ah, this is treated as if you purchased it and you financed it with debt. Ah, longer term assets, the leasing of longer term assets gives the, the lessee some ownership rights. So it makes sense then, you know, if we sign a lease, like I always think about this when my daughter was in college, you know, she signed a one year lease. That really didn't do anything to her financial statements because I paid for it. But if she would have signed a 10 year lease, then that would probably have been defined as a capital lease. And then it would have impacted her financial statement. Maybe not immediately if I were still paying it, but after a while, sooner or later, when she graduated and got a job, it, she would take over this, then uh, she would probably treat it differently than, than just plain old rental expense. Right, so it's reported as an asset and a liability on the balance sheet, and then it affects interest expense and depreciation. And so I'm, I'm guessing you know the orange area down there. When capitalizing an operating lease, the lessee's financial leverage increases and the interest 
coverage ratio declines, right? This is just called leverage. How about if we look at, uh, at a quick example? Uh, let's suppose that we're going to finance a vehicle as an operating lease, must make annual payments of $10,000, 12% interest rate over six years. So down the second column there are some reported amounts. These are all in US dollars. And this is a different company too, by the way. Look, Move Incorporated. And then there are some adjustments. All right, so I, we put in red there, 41,114, EBIT 3148, interest expense 4934. And so that then implies that this pro forma amount over on the right hand side, that's way different than that second column. And then of course the associated ratios are gonna be different. So look at leverage 131 to 189, debt to equity 46 to 105, interest coverage 325 down to 137. So what conclusion can you make? What did we just say here? Financial leverage increases, interest coverage ratio declines. So there's the mathematics behind it. Now, of course, you're probably wondering where we came up with those uh, red numbers. And so let's go ahead and just do this very quickly here. I know there are bunches of you that like to use that, uh, that old time uh, present value of an annuity formula. So that's what we did right there in the middle to get that 41,114. But I've, I've got my financial calculator here. So you guys want to get yours out and do this with me. So we're going to say, we're going to say 10,000. That's payment, right? We'll say zero is future value. We'll do 12 is I, six is N. Oh, oh, I hit the wrong button. Let me start that over. 10,000 is payment, <laughs> zero is future value. 12 is I, 6 is N, hit present value, running, running, running. There's our 41, 114. So you can, you can use that formula, you can use your calculator. Then we'll divide that over six years to get the depreciation expense. And then we'll subtract that from the EBIT to get the adjustment of 3148. And then the interest expense is just the 41, 114 times that 12%. So let me just go back here. Here I've, we've got those numbers in orange. Here we've got those numbers in red. Uh, notice the LOS says analyze and interpret how those balance sheet modifications, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would surely be prepared since these are simple calculations to be able to complete a table. So look at the conclusion there. Capitalizing the operating lease results in increased financial leverage and declining interest coverage. All right, we said that, where did we say that? Way back here, and then we just proved it, and then we just proved it again mathematically. And that takes us through those five LOSs there. And uh, I would divide my time equally on uh, in this reading.